You're traveling through the unknown, a journey beyond the corners of reality, where the shadows whisper and the chill runs deep. Welcome to the dimension where your deepest fears are given form. This is the Midnight Mystery. Ever since I moved into this old family house, I felt like it was hiding something from me. It's not like I believe in ghosts or hidden treasures, but, you know, there's always that whisper in the back of your head that says, what if? So, with too much time on my hands and a newfound sense of inheritance after Aunt Martha passed, I decided to make this place truly mine. Starting with the basement seemed logical. It was cluttered, dusty, and frankly a bit eerie. One Saturday, armed with a determination only seen in those home renovation shows, I ventured down. This is going to be a long day, I muttered to myself, surveying the mountains of boxes and old furniture that looked like they hadn't been touched since the 70s. I started with the boxes, sorting through memories, junk, and a surprising amount of old newspapers. Hours passed, and I had made decent progress when my hand brushed against something cold and metallic, hidden beneath a frayed rug. Curiosity peaked, I cleared the area to find a small, ornate door handle set into the floor. No way, I breathed out, a mix of excitement and disbelief coursing through me. A secret door? Here? Kneeling down, I examined it closer. It was definitely a door, complete with an old-fashioned lock that looked like it needed a key I definitely didn't have. The logical part of my brain told me to be cautious, but when has the logical part ever won against curiosity? I remember pausing, a part of me knowing this could change everything. Well, here goes nothing, I said aloud, not entirely sure who I was talking to. I fetched a few tools from the garage, and with a bit of effort and a lot of noise, I managed to pry the door open. The rush of cool air that greeted me was unexpected. Peering inside, I saw steps leading down into darkness. An actual secret room? The words felt surreal as they left my mouth. Fetching a flashlight, I hesitated only for a moment before descending. The room was unlike anything I had imagined. It was preserved, almost untouched by time, filled with objects and furniture that seemed to belong to a different era. In the center, a large, heavy-looking book lay on a table, its cover embossed with symbols I couldn't recognize. I picked up the book, the pages filled with handwritten notes, sketches of strange artifacts and passages in a language I didn't understand. It was fascinating, and I couldn't help but feel like I was meant to find this. What were you up to, Aunt Martha? I whispered half expecting an answer. It was then I heard a noise, a creak from the stairs I had just come down. My heart skipped a beat. Hello? I called out, shining the flashlight towards the staircase. But there was nothing there, just the empty path I had walked. Shaking off the feeling of being watched, I decided it was best to go back upstairs, promising myself I'd return tomorrow. There was a mystery here, and I was determined to unravel it. Little did I know, this discovery was the beginning of an obsession that would consume me, blurring the lines between reality and something far darker. As I locked the basement door behind me that night, the air felt charged, heavy with anticipation. Or was it a warning? Waking up the next day, the memory of the secret room felt like a dream, one of those that's too good to let go of. I half expected to walk into the basement and find nothing but wall where the door had been. But there it was, just as real in the daylight as it had been under the beam of my flashlight. I couldn't shake off the excitement, a feeling I hadn't felt since I was a kid on Christmas morning. With a steaming cup of coffee in hand, I descended into the basement once again, this time with more resolve. The room awaited, silent and imposing. As I stood at the threshold, I hesitated. You're being ridiculous, Dean, I scolded myself. It's just a room. Taking a deep breath, I stepped inside, the air cool and musty like stepping into the past. I spent the morning exploring every inch. The book I had found the day before was filled with entries that read like a mix of a diary and a scientific journal, penned by an ancestor I never knew I had. Charles, a name that felt both familiar and foreign. His writings were cryptic, filled with references to rituals and power, a pursuit of something beyond the grasp of ordinary men. The more I read, the more I was drawn in. Charles spoke of a breakthrough, a discovery that would change everything. But the details were frustratingly vague. What had he found? And more importantly, where was it? Where? My curiosity turned into an obsession as the days passed. I barely noticed. Friends called, but I ignored them. 
my thoughts consumed by Charles's work. I started seeing patterns in the random symbols in the mundane. It felt like I was on the verge of something monumental. One evening, as I pored over the pages by the light of a flickering candle, electricity felt wrong in that space. I found it. A reference to a hidden compartment within the room, a place where Charles stored his most precious findings. The excitement was palpable as I searched, touching every inch of the walls until, finally, my fingers brushed against a seam. A hidden panel. Heart racing I pressed, and with a click it swung open, revealing a small alcove. Inside was a box, ornate and locked tight. My hands trembled as I picked it up. This was it. Charles's greatest discovery. But there was no key, no way to open it. My frustration boiled over. You've got to be kidding me, I exclaimed to the empty room. That's when I heard it, a whisper, so faint I thought I had imagined it. Patience, Dean. I froze, the box in my hands. The voice was unfamiliar, yet it filled the room, echoing off the walls. I was alone, but at that moment, I understood a fundamental truth. I wasn't. Who's there? My voice sounded small, swallowed by the shadows. No answer came, but the air shifted, growing colder. I realized then that I had stepped into a world far beyond my understanding, one that Charles had been a part of. Placing the box back, I left the room, a mix of fear and intrigue propelling me forward. As I ascended the stairs, the weight of what I had uncovered settled on my shoulders. The secret room wasn't just a forgotten part of the house, it was a gateway to something ancient, something that whispered in the dark. That night, I lay in bed, the image of the locked box seared into my mind. I knew one thing for certain, I had to find the key, and I had a feeling that whatever lay inside would change everything. But as I drifted off to sleep, a part of me wondered if some doors were meant to stay closed. My curiosity turned into an obsession as the days passed. I barely noticed. Friends called, but I ignored them. My thoughts consumed by Charles's work. I started seeing patterns in the random symbols in the mundane. It felt like I was on the verge of something monumental. One evening, as I pored over the pages by the light of a flickering candle, electricity felt wrong in that space. I found it. A reference to a hidden compartment within the room, a place where Charles stored his most precious findings. The excitement was palpable as I searched, touching every inch of the walls until, finally, my fingers brushed against a seam. A hidden panel. Heart racing I pressed, and with a click it swung open, revealing a small alcove. Inside was a box, ornate and locked tight. My hands trembled as I picked it up. This was it. Charles's greatest discovery. But there was no key, no way to open it. My frustration boiled over. You've got to be kidding me, I exclaimed to the empty room. That's when I heard it, a whisper, so faint I thought I had imagined it. Patience, Dean. I froze, the box in my hands. The voice was unfamiliar, yet it filled the room, echoing off the walls. I was alone, but at that moment, I understood a fundamental truth. I wasn't. Who's there? My voice sounded small, swallowed by the shadows. No answer came, but the air shifted, growing colder. I realized then that I had stepped into a world far beyond my understanding, one that Charles had been a part of. Placing the box back, I left the room, a mix of fear and intrigue propelling me forward. As I ascended the stairs, the weight of what I had uncovered settled on my shoulders. The secret room wasn't just a forgotten part of the house, it was a gateway to something ancient, something that whispered in the dark. That night, I lay in bed, the image of the locked box seared into my mind. I knew one thing for certain, I had to find the key, and I had a feeling that whatever lay inside would change everything. But as I drifted off to sleep, a part of me wondered if some doors were meant to stay closed. Days blurred into nights, a ceaseless cycle of research, reading and restless sleep. The room had become my world, its secrets whispering to me in the quiet moments, urging me forward. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was on the brink of something monumental, something that had consumed Charles and now beckoned to me from beyond the veil of time. My friends' concerns grew louder, their voices' messages left unheard on my phone. Dean, you're scaring us. Please, let's talk. But their words were just noise against the symphony of discovery that played in my mind. I was close, so close to unlocking the truth hidden within the box and the room. One evening, as I sat surrounded by my notes and the flickering candlelight that had become my only source of comfort, I found it. 
not the key to the box, but to the room itself. Charles had hidden a message, not in the diary, but within the very walls of the room. It was a ritual, one that promised to unlock the secrets he had buried with him. The excitement I felt was indescribable. This is it, I whispered to the shadows. This is how I find the answers. The ritual required things I could only find within the house, objects that held emotional significance. It felt as though Charles had designed it, knowing one day I would follow in his footsteps. Gathering everything I needed, I waited for the stroke of midnight, the time Charles insisted was the only moment the ritual could be performed. The air grew heavy, charged with anticipation or perhaps warning. I ignored the shiver that ran down my spine, the feeling of eyes watching from the darkness. I'm not afraid, I lied to the empty room and to myself. As I began, reciting the words Charles had written, the candle flames danced wildly, casting long shadows that twisted and turned in the corners of the room. A wind that had no source howled through the sealed space, and for a moment I hesitated. But the desire for knowledge pushed me forward, driving me to complete the ritual. When it was done, the room fell silent, the candles snuffed out by an unseen force. A cold dread filled me, the realization that I had crossed a threshold from which there was no return. The darkness felt alive, breathing, and in it I heard the whisper again, louder now, a chorus of voices that spoke a single word, free. I reached for my flashlight, the beam cutting through the darkness to reveal that the room had changed. The walls, once filled with the benign clutter of the past, now pulsed with a malevolent energy. And the box, the focus of my obsession, sat open on the table, empty. Panic set in. The voices grew louder, not just whispers now, but screams of anger and pain that filled the room, filled my mind, pushing me to the edge of madness. What have I done? I cried out, my voice lost in the cacophony. I fled the room, the sounds of my own heartbeat and the voices chasing me up the stairs. But even as I reached the safety of my living room, I knew there was no escaping what I had unleashed. My home, my sanctuary, had become a prison, haunted by the consequences of my actions. In the days that followed, my life became a living nightmare. Shadows moved of their own accord, cold spots appeared randomly, and the feeling of being watched was constant. I tried to reach out, to explain to my friends what had happened, but how could I? How could they understand the terror that now lived within the walls of my house? I was alone, trapped by my own curiosity, and the obsession that had led me down this path. The room, Charles's legacy, had become my tormentor, a daily reminder of the price of seeking knowledge that was never meant to be uncovered. As I sat in the darkness, the whispers my only company, I realized the truth. The box had never been meant to be opened, the secrets never meant to be discovered, and now I was bound to them a prisoner of the dark curiosity that had led me to this moment. And so I waited, trapped in the nightmare of my own making, wondering if there was any escape from the horror I had invited into my home. The house no longer felt like mine. It had become a shell, haunted by echoes of the past and the malevolent presence I had unleashed. Sleep eluded me, nights spent listening to the whispers that seemed to seep from the very walls. My days blurred into a continuous loop of searching for answers in Charles's diary hoping to find a way to reverse what I had done. I knew I was losing myself, caught in the web of obsession and fear. Yet there was a part of me that refused to give up, clinging to the hope that there was a solution, a way to fix everything. One afternoon, as I sat amidst the chaos of my once orderly living room, a breakthrough came. Not from the diary, but from a conversation I imagined having with Charles. You wanted knowledge, Dean, I heard him say in the depths of my mind. But did you ever stop to think about the price? His words struck me, a realization that I had been so blinded by my desire to uncover the secrets of the room that I hadn't considered the consequences. It was this recklessness that had led me here, to this moment of despair. Determined, I dove back into the diary, reading between the lines, searching for anything I might have missed. And there, hidden in the margins of a page I had read a dozen times before, was a note. A potential solution but one that came with its own warning. To reverse the summoning, a sacrifice must be made, a tether to bind the entity back to its realm. The words chilled me to the bone. A sacrifice, what had Charles meant? My mind raced with possibilities, each more horrifying than the last. But as the shadows grew longer and the whispers louder, I knew I had no other choice. I had to try. Gathering the remnants of my courage, 
I prepared for the ritual. The house seemed to sense my intention, the atmosphere heavy with anticipation, or perhaps a hunger for what was to come. As midnight approached, I began. The ritual was more complex than the first, requiring every ounce of my will and concentration. The air around me crackled with energy, the whispers crescendoing into an unintelligible chant. And then, silence. A heavy, oppressive silence that weighed on my chest like a physical force. I waited, breath held, for any sign that I had succeeded. But what came next was not the relief of release, but the realization of my naivety. The entity had never intended to leave, its whispers now clear in my mind. You cannot bind what you do not understand, Dean. You have only strengthened me. Panic set in as the house seemed to come alive, the shadows twisting into grotesque forms, the air thick with the smell of decay. I had failed, and in my failure I had made things worse. I fled the room, the entity's laughter echoing in my ears, a sound that would haunt me for the rest of my days. The house, once my refuge, was now a prison, a reminder of the cost of my curiosity. In the days that followed, I became a shell of my former self, trapped in a nightmare of my own making. The entity made its presence known, a constant tormentor, turning every shadow into a threat, every noise into a warning. I had unleashed something ancient and malevolent, and now it was bound to me, a dark companion that I could not escape. The realization that my actions had consequences, not just for me but for anyone who crossed the threshold of the house, weighed heavily on me. As I sat in the darkness, the only light the flickering candle that had become my constant companion, I understood the true horror of my situation. I was alone, utterly and irrevocably alone, with only the whispers of the entity for company. The house, with its secrets and shadows, had become a labyrinth, a trap that I had sprung on myself. And as I pondered my next move, I knew that there was only one way to end this nightmare. But the price, as Charles had warned, was more than I could have ever imagined. And as I made my decision, I couldn't help but wonder if it was worth it, if the knowledge I had sought was worth the cost of my soul. The realization that I had to face the consequences of my actions was both terrifying and sobering. The house, once a symbol of my heritage and curiosity, had turned into a haunted mausoleum of my failures. The entity, a malevolent shadow born from my obsession, was now an inseparable part of my existence, its whispers a constant reminder of my folly. I knew there was only one way to end this nightmare, a final act that would either save me or condemn me to an eternity of torment. The ritual required a sacrifice, a life to act as a tether for the entity to be bound and banished back to its realm. The diary was clear, the price of such a ritual was steep, and as I sat in the dim light of dawn, I knew what I had to do. With a heavy heart, I began the preparations, gathering the necessary items with a sense of resigned determination. The entity seemed to sense my plan, its whispers turning into howls of rage and anticipation. The air crackled with malevolent energy, the house creaking and groaning as if in pain. As midnight approached, I took my place in the center of the room, the candlelight casting long shadows that danced on the walls. I started the ritual, reciting the ancient words with a clarity and focus I didn't know I possessed. The entity raged against me, a storm of darkness and malice, but I stood firm, driven by the need to end this, no matter the cost. The final words of the ritual left my lips, a plea for forgiveness and redemption. A blinding light filled the room, the sound of a thousand voices screaming in unison. And then, silence. I opened my eyes, expecting to find peace or perhaps the darkness of death. But what greeted me was neither. The room was unchanged, the shadows as present as ever, but the whispers. The whispers were silent. Relief flooded through me, followed quickly by confusion. Had I succeeded? The diary lay open on the table, its pages fluttering as if caught in a breeze. And then I saw it, a new entry written in my hand, a message from the entity. You cannot escape your fate, Dean. The price of knowledge is eternal. I felt a chill run down my spine as the truth dawned on me. The ritual had worked, but not in the way I had intended. The entity was bound, yes, but not banished. It was bound to me, a part of me now, forever whispering its dark secrets into my soul. I had sought knowledge, delved into mysteries best left untouched, and now I was the keeper of those secrets, a guardian of darkness. The house, the room, they were no longer haunted by the entity, but by me. I was the tether 
the sacrifice that had been required. As the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, I remained in the house, a prisoner of my own making. Friends and family stopped coming, stopped calling. I was alone, but never truly alone. The entity was always there, a whisper in the dark, a shadow in the light. I had become a part of the house's lore, another ghost in its walls. My story, a cautionary tale of curiosity and obsession, would be whispered in the dark, a warning to those who might follow in my footsteps. And so, I write this final entry, not as a man, but as a remnant of one. To those who find this diary, let my story be a warning. Some doors, once opened, can never be closed. Some knowledge comes at a price too great to bear, and some secrets should remain hidden, forever buried in the shadows. The night was a tempest, the kind that rattled the old bones of Station 98.6 FM, nestled deep in the heart of rural New England. It was my last night, the final broadcast before the station would be shuttered for good, succumbing to the relentless march of progress and the digital age. I'd spent countless nights behind the mic, my voice a lone beacon in the dark for the insomniacs, the night owls, and the lost souls seeking solace in the wee hours. But tonight was different. The storm outside seemed almost personal, a cosmic send-off for a dying relic. Alex, you sure you want to go through with this? Sam's voice cut through the static of the pre-show jitters. My co-host and producer, a tech whiz with a penchant for the supernatural, was visibly unnerved. Sam had always been superstitious, claiming the station was cursed, haunted by the ghosts of tragedies past. It's just another night, Sam. Besides, it's not like the ghosts are going to pack up and leave just because we are. I tried to sound more confident than I felt. The truth was, the station had always had an eerie vibe, especially at night. But I wasn't about to admit that now, not when we had a show to run. The clock struck midnight, and we went live. Good evening, folks. This is Alex Mercer, and you're tuned into the last ever broadcast of Station 98.6 FM. It's a bittersweet night, and I'm here with Sam Rivera. Say hi, Sam. Hi, folks. Let's make this a night to remember, Sam said, mustering a cheerful tone. But the cheer felt hollow, swallowed up by the storm raging outside. The first hour passed with the usual fare, dedicated songs, a couple of call-ins from regular listeners wishing us well. It was touching, really. Then came the call that changed everything. Station 98.6 FM, you're on the air. What's your name and where are you calling from? I asked, following protocol. A long pause. Then, a voice. So cold it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. You shouldn't be there. It's coming for you. The line went dead. Sam and I exchanged uneasy glances. Probably just a prank, I said, though my voice betrayed my fear. But the strange occurrences didn't stop there. Lights flickered erratically, casting shadows that seemed to move of their own volition. The temperature dropped, breaths materializing in the air. Unexplained noises echoed through the station, sounds that couldn't be rationalized as the building settling or the storm outside. Alex, I don't like this. We should cut the broadcast and leave, Sam whispered a tremor in his voice. No, we have a show to finish. Besides, it's just a storm. Electrical issues and old building sounds, that's all. I lied, trying to convince myself as much as Sam. Then the caller phoned again. You cannot hide. It knows you're there. It's always been there, waiting. And now, it's time. The line cut before I could respond. Panic set in. The atmosphere thickened with dread. Sam began to ramble about the local folklore, the cursed land on which the station was built and the tragic events that had unfolded over the years. I wanted to dismiss it all as nonsense, but the fear gnawing at my gut told me otherwise. As the night progressed, the station seemed to come alive with malevolent energy. Shadows danced in the corners of my vision, whispers filled the airwaves, and an oppressive feeling of being watched settled over us. We need to stick together, Alex. Whatever this is, we're in it together, Sam said, his voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, together until the end. I replied, not realizing then how prophetic those words would be. As the night deepened, the storm outside seemed to mirror the chaos brewing within the walls of Station 98.6 FM. Sam and I huddled in the dimly lit broadcast room, the only source of warmth in a building that had suddenly turned cold and unwelcoming. The flickering lights and the eerie shadows played tricks on our eyes, but what came next was undeniably real. The caller, as we had dubbed our mysterious harasser, rang again. 
this time I answered with a hesitant, Hello? You cannot escape its grasp. It has been awakened, the voice hissed, a sound so chilling it felt as though ice water had been poured down my spine. Who are you? What do you want from us? I demanded, my voice cracking with fear. But the line went dead, leaving us with more questions than answers. Alex, this isn't right. We're not alone here. Can't you feel it? Sam's voice was filled with terror, his usual skepticism drowned by the palpable fear that now consumed us both. I couldn't deny it any longer. The air was thick, charged with a malevolent energy that seemed to seep into my very bones. Let's go through the archives, I suggested, hoping to find some explanation, some rational reason for the night's events. There has to be something, some clue as to what's happening. As we scoured the old records and tapes, the storm outside reached a fever pitch. The wind howled like a banshee, and for a moment, I wondered if we were listening to the storm or the cries of something not of this world. Then we found it, an old dusty tape labeled Do Not Air. Curiosity overcame fear, and I loaded the tape into the player. The audio that filled the room was not of this world. A cacophony of whispers, screams, and something else. Something ancient and angry. The air grew colder, and the lights flickered more violently. Turn it off, Alex! Turn it off! Sam yelled. But I was frozen, unable to move as the sounds enveloped us. And then, silence. The room felt heavier, as if the air itself was pressing down on us. What did we just unleash? Sam whispered, his face pale in the flickering light. I had no answers, only a deep, sinking feeling of dread. We need to end this. Let's finish the broadcast and get out of here, I said, more to convince myself than Sam. But as we attempted to resume the show, the equipment malfunctioned, the screens displaying static and the microphones emitting a harsh, grating noise. It was as if the station itself was rejecting us. Then the shadows began to move. Not flickers this time, but clear, deliberate movements. Forms that were almost human but twisted, wrong in ways that made my stomach churn. Alex, we're not alone, Sam said, his voice barely above a whisper. I could only nod, my throat tight with fear. The studio door slammed shut with a force that shook the walls, plunging us into darkness. The only light came from the eerie glow of the equipment screens, casting grotesque shadows across the room. And then, they appeared. Figures, made of shadow and malice, circling us, whispering in a language that sounded ancient and deadly. We need to fight, I said, though I had no idea how to combat shadows. Desperation led us to the only weapon we had, our broadcast. Let's use the frequency. Maybe we can disrupt them, drive them away, Sam suggested, his voice trembling but determined. With shaking hands, I adjusted the dials, pushing the equipment to its limits. We needed a frequency, something powerful, something pure. The figures drew closer, their whispers growing louder, more insistent. I could feel their malice, their hunger. It was suffocating, consuming. And then, with a final twist of the dial, we unleashed a wave of sound through the speakers. It was a primal scream, a cry of defiance and hope in the face of utter despair. The effect was immediate. The figures recoiled, their forms dissolving into the air like smoke. The pressure lifted and for a moment, we could breathe. But the relief was short-lived. The storm outside intensified, as if angered by our resistance. The building groaned under the force and I knew we were far from safe. We need to leave now, I said, grabbing Sam's arm. But the path to the door was not clear. The shadows lurked, waiting for us to make a move. It was now aware of us. Sam and I burst through the studio door, gasping for air as if we had been submerged underwater. The storm outside raged with renewed fury, a tangible manifestation of the chaos that had been unleashed within Station 98.6 FM. Despite the danger that howled with the wind, it felt safer than the malevolence we had left behind in the broadcast room. We can't just run, Alex. That thing... It's connected to the station, to us now, Sam said between ragged breaths, his eyes wide with a fear that mirrored my own. I nodded, my mind racing for solutions in a situation that defied logic. The archives, the tape we played, there has to be a connection. We need to understand what we're dealing with if we're going to stand a chance. Armed with flashlights, we made our way to the station's heart, where decades of history lay entombed in records and old broadcasts. The storm seemed to follow us, the building creaking ominously as we delved deeper into the past. As we rifled through dusty boxes and ancient files, the truth began to unfold like a sinister tapestry. 
Station 98.6 FM had been built on ground tainted by tragedy and darkness. A series of unexplained disappearances and deaths linked back to broadcasts that were never supposed to air, rituals hidden in plain sight. The Entity, I whispered, the name await on my tongue. It's not just haunting the station, it's bound to it, feeding on the fear and darkness. Sam found a journal, the ramblings of a former host who had dabbled in the occult, seeking to harness the Entity for his own gain. But instead of control, he had found madness and a door that should have remained closed. We need to close it, Alex. For good, Sam said, determination stealing his voice. I nodded, the plan forming in my mind. The broadcast. We'll use the station's own frequency against it, fight darkness with light. We set to work, piecing together the remnants of rituals and broadcasts, searching for a frequency that could act as a beacon of hope amidst the despair. It was a long shot, but it was all we had. The shadows watched us work, their presence a constant threat that slithered at the edge of our vision. But we pressed on, driven by the need to right a wrong that had festered in the heart of Station 98.6 FM for too long. Finally, we were ready. The equipment hummed to life, a beacon in the dark. I took a deep breath and spoke into the microphone, my voice steady despite the trembling in my hands. This is Alex Mercer, and you're listening to the final broadcast of Station 98.6 FM. Tonight, we face the darkness that has lurked within these walls, a darkness that has consumed too many. But we stand together, a light in the shadow, a voice in the silence. To those lost, to those afraid, know that you are not alone. Tonight, we banish the darkness, together. The frequency surged, a symphony of light and sound that filled the station, the air vibrating with power. The entity, a formless malice that had hidden in the shadows, recoiled as the broadcast pierced the darkness. It was a battle of wills, a fight for the soul of Station 98.6 FM. The entity lashed out, the building shaking as if it would tear itself apart. But we held firm, our voices a mantra against the storm, and then silence. The storm abated, the darkness receded, and for a moment there was peace. But our relief was short-lived. The silence was a harbinger, a pause before the final confrontation. The entity, though weakened, was not defeated. It gathered its strength, preparing for a final assault that would determine the fate of Station 98.6 FM and all who dared to stand against the darkness. As Sam and I stumbled out into the frigid night, the storm seemed to roar in defiance, as if angered by our escape from the shadows within Station 98.6 FM. The cold bit into our flesh, a stark contrast to the suffocating warmth of the haunted studio we'd left behind. But even as we sought refuge in the physical storm, we knew the real tempest raged on inside, fueled by something ancient and malevolent. Alex, we can't just leave it like this. It'll follow us, or worse, it'll latch onto anyone who dares enter that place again, Sam said through chattering teeth, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and determination. He was right. The entity we'd awoken wasn't bound by walls or geography. It was unleashed, unfettered, and if we didn't find a way to bind it again, the consequences would be dire. We need to go back, I said, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. We need to end this, once and for all. Sam nodded, and together we made our way back to the station, the wind howling around us like the cries of the damned. Inside, the building was eerily silent, the chaotic energy that had pervaded it before now replaced with a waiting, watchful stillness. It was as if the entity knew we were back, as if it was inviting us to try our luck again. We need a plan, Sam whispered, pulling out schematics of the station from his backpack. There's an old transmitter in the basement, from the early days of the station. It's powerful, more powerful than anything we have up here. If we can modify it, use it to broadcast a counter-frequency, his voice trailed off as the reality of our plan set in. It was a long shot, a desperate gambit that relied on technology and a bit of arcane knowledge we barely understood. But it was all we had. The journey to the basement was a descent into madness. Every step echoed unnaturally, as if we were walking not on concrete but on the bones of those who'd come before us. Shadows flickered at the edge of our vision, always just out of sight, and whispers filled the air, taunting, threatening. But we pushed on driven by a need to end the nightmare we'd become a part of. The old transmitter was exactly as Sam had described it, a behemoth of tubes and wires, dormant but still imposing. 
Working together, we began the task of modifying it, repurposing the ancient technology for our needs. Sam's knowledge of the supernatural combined with my experience in broadcasting created a makeshift weapon, a beacon of hope in the darkness. As we worked, the entity made its presence known. The air grew thick, heavy with the scent of decay and old blood. Figures appeared, more solid than before, their eyes hollow pits of despair and hunger. They circled us, a pack of predators waiting for the moment to strike. We're running out of time, Alex, Sam said, his voice steady despite the terror that clawed at the edges of his words. Just a few more adjustments, I replied, my fingers flying over the ancient dials and switches. And then it was ready. The entity surged forward as we powered up the transmitter, a tidal wave of darkness intent on snuffing out our light. But we were ready. I grabbed the microphone, and with a voice that carried the weight of our desperation and hope, I spoke. This is Alex Mercer and Sam Rivera, broadcasting live from station 98.6 FM. To whatever listens in the darkness, hear us now. You are not welcome here. This is our final stand. The words were a catalyst, igniting the energy we'd harnessed. The transmitter roared to life, sending out a counter-frequency that cut through the darkness like a blade. The figures screamed, their forms dissolving as the light from the transmitter banished them. But the entity itself was a different beast. It fought back, a maelstrom of hatred and malice that threatened to overwhelm us. The station shook to its foundations, the very air charged with the power of the unseen battle. We need more power, Sam yelled, adjusting the dials frantically. I joined him, pouring every ounce of our energy into the transmitter. The light grew brighter, the frequency sharper, until with a final, ear-splitting crack, the darkness shattered. Silence fell, heavy and absolute. We'd done it, or so we hoped, or so we. The dawn was silent, a stark contrast to the cacophony of the night before. Sam and I trudged through the snow, the station's ruins casting long shadows in the early light. We had survived, yes, but at what cost? The silence was unnerving, as if the storm and the entity had taken the world's noise with them when they vanished. Alex, do you think it's really over? Sam's voice was low, almost lost in the vast quiet that surrounded us. I glanced back at the skeletal remains of Station 98.6 FM, an uneasy feeling settling in my stomach. I don't know, Sam. I don't know if something like that can ever be truly over. We reached the edge of the forest, the first rays of the sun filtering through the trees, casting eerie patterns on the snow. That's when we heard it, a faint whisper, carried on the wind, almost imperceptible. Did you hear that? I stopped, straining my ears. Sam nodded, his face pale. It sounded like, like the broadcast. Impossible. The station was destroyed, the equipment in ruins. Yet, as we stood there, the whispers grew louder forming words, a message repeating over and over. You cannot silence what has been awakened. The realization hit me with the force of a physical blow. The entity wasn't bound to the station. It was bound to the broadcast, to the frequency we had unleashed. And in our attempt to destroy it, we had set it free. We need to warn people, Sam said, panic edging his voice. But how? The station was gone and with it our only means of broadcasting. And who would believe us? Two survivors of a night of horror, with nothing but wild tales of ancient entities and cursed broadcasts. We have to try, I insisted, though doubt clouded my mind. The world needed to know, to be prepared for whatever might come next. We made our way back to civilization, our minds reeling with plans and warnings. But as we reached the outskirts of town, we realized something was terribly wrong. The silence followed us, oppressive and complete. No birds chirped, no cars moved along the roads. The town lay still, as if frozen in time. And everywhere, from the open windows of houses, from the abandoned cars on the street, came the sound of a broadcast, a soft, whispering voice that chilled the blood. You cannot silence what has been awakened. The entity hadn't just escaped, it had spread, carried by the very frequency we had hoped would be its demise. It was everywhere, infecting the airwaves, seeping into the minds of every living soul, Sam and I exchanged a look of horror. We had thought to end a nightmare, but instead, we had unleashed it upon the world. As we walked through the silent town, the full magnitude of our actions weighed heavily on us. We had become the harbingers of a horror beyond comprehension, a darkness that spread like a plague through the very fabric of reality. And then, 
as we stood in the center of the silent town, the broadcast changed. No longer content with mere whispers, it grew louder, more insistent. Join us. The air around us shimmered, the world bending, twisting into impossible shapes. Figures emerged from the shadows, their eyes voids of despair and malice, their whispers a siren call to join them in the darkness. Sam and I ran, but it was futile. The entity had the world in its grasp, and there was nowhere to hide, nowhere to escape to. As the figures closed in, the last thing I heard was the voice from the broadcast, a mockery of our final attempt to fight back. The last broadcast of Station 98.6 FM will now be forever. And then, darkness. In our quest to silence a nightmare, we had become part of it, our actions the final note in a symphony of horror that would play out across the world. The last broadcast was not an end, but a beginning, a dark and horrific twist in a tale of human folly and ancient evils awakened. As the entity consumed us, I realized the true horror was not in being hunted or haunted, but in becoming the very thing we had sought to destroy. And in the silent, shadowed world that the entity had claimed, our voices would whisper alongside the others, a never-ending broadcast of despair and darkness. So last summer, I was on this road trip, just cruising along with no real destination in mind. The sun was starting to dip below the horizon, and I realized I needed to find a place to crash for the night before it got too dark to see the road. That's when I saw it. This rundown motel nestled off the side of the highway, its neon sign flickering like a dying firefly. Now, I'm no stranger to staying in dodgy places, but this one looked like it hadn't seen a fresh coat of paint since the 70s. I hesitated for a moment, considering whether I should keep driving and find something nicer. But then I remembered how tired I was. My eyelids were practically glued shut from hours of staring at the road. So, I decided to take my chances and pulled into the gravel parking lot. As I stepped out of the car, I was hit with a blast of desert heat, the kind that makes you feel like you're walking through a sauna. The air was thick with the scent of dust and gasoline, and I could hear the distant hum of cicadas in the bushes. I made my way to the lobby, pushing open the creaky door with a rusty squeal. Inside, it was like stepping into a time capsule from the 80s. Faded wallpaper, cracked linoleum floors, the works. And the smell. It was like a mix of old cigarettes and industrial strength air freshener. The guy behind the front desk barely glanced up as I approached, his eyes glued to the TV playing some infomercial for miracle weight loss pills. Without looking away, he slid a room key across the counter and grunted something that might have been, enjoy your stay. I took the key and headed down the dimly lit hallway to my room. The carpet squelched under my shoes with every step, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. But I chalked it up to tiredness and pushed open the door to my room. Inside, it was nothing fancy. Just your typical motel room with a bed that sagged in the middle, and a bathroom that looked like it hadn't been cleaned since the Nixon administration. But at that moment, it might as well have been the penthouse suite at the plaza. All I cared about was crashing out and catching some Zs. And let me tell you, I was out like a light the second my head hit the pillow. All right, picture this. I'm out like a light, dead to the world after a long day of driving. But then, out of nowhere, I'm rudely awakened by this god-awful scratching noise. I mean, it was like nails on a chalkboard, but a hundred times worse. At first, I tried to brush it off, thinking it was just the old building settling or some critters having a party in the walls. But as the scratching got louder and more persistent, I couldn't deny it any longer. Something was seriously wrong. So there I am, tossing and turning, trying to drown out the noise with my pillow, but it's like the scratching is drilling into my skull. I couldn't take it anymore. With a groan of frustration, I fumble around for my phone and switch on the flashlight, ready to investigate. Now, shining a bright light in the middle of the night when you're half asleep and freaked out? Not the smartest move, but hey, I was desperate for answers. I start scouring the room, shining my flashlight into every nook and cranny, trying to pinpoint the source of that infernal noise. I check under the bed. Nothing. In the closet, nada. Behind the curtains, zilch. Just when I'm about to give up, I hear it again, faint, but unmistakable, coming from the far corner of the room. My heart skips a beat and I slowly make my way over, flashlight trembling in my hand. I kneel down and shine the light along the baseboard, and that's when I see it. A tiny gap between the wall and the floorboard. And in that gap? Eyes. Dozens of them staring back at me from the shadows. 
I'm talking full-on horror movie stuff here. People crammed into the space between the walls, their faces twisted in silent agony as they stare out at me with empty eyes. Now let me tell you, I didn't waste any time. I bolted out of there faster than a bat out of hell. But as soon as I was safely outside, I did what any sane person would do. I called the cops. I told them everything, from the scratching noises to the people in the walls. I don't know if they believed me or not, but they said they'd send someone out to check it out. But here's the thing, I haven't heard anything since. No news reports, no updates from the police. It's like the whole thing never happened. All right, so after that whole ordeal at the creepy motel, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story. I mean, finding people living in the walls? That's the kind of thing that sticks with you, you know? I waited around for days, hoping to hear something from the cops. Some kind of explanation or closure. But as the days turned into weeks, it became pretty clear that they weren't going to give me any answers. Typical, right? But I'm not the kind of person to just sit around and wait for things to happen. No, sir. I decided to take matters into my own hands. So, armed with nothing but my laptop and a burning curiosity, I dove headfirst into the depths of the internet, determined to uncover the truth. I scoured news articles, police reports, anything I could get my hands on that might shed some light on what had happened at that motel. But no matter how hard I looked, I kept hitting dead ends. It was like the whole thing had been wiped off the face of the earth. But then, just when I was about to throw in the towel, I stumbled upon something. A forum post from someone claiming to have stayed at the same motel and experienced the same weird noises. Bingo. I reached out to them, hoping they might have some answers. And to my surprise, they did. According to them, the motel had a seriously messed up history like horror movie levels of messed up. Apparently, the owner of the motel was involved in all sorts of shady business dealings, using the place as a front for all kinds of illegal activities. And those people living in the walls? They were his victims, trapped and forgotten, their screams drowned out by the noise of the highway outside. It was a lot to take in, let me tell you. But it also made sense. The scratching noises, the feeling of being watched, it all fit together like pieces of a messed up puzzle. But even with some answers finally in hand, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled over me that night. I mean, who knows what else was going on at that motel? And what if there were other motels out there with similar dark secrets? I may never know the full extent of what happened at that place, but one thing's for sure, it's a night I'll never forget. And as for staying in sketchy motels? Yeah, I think I'll pass from now on. This happened just a couple of months ago. It's one of those chilly autumn nights where the air feels crisp and the leaves crunch under your feet. I had just left my friend's place after hanging out for a while, and now I was driving down this deserted road. The only sound being the hum of my car's engine and the occasional rustle of leaves in the wind. I was lost in my thoughts, just enjoying the solitude and the freedom of the open road. But then, out of nowhere, something caught my eye. A figure standing by the side of the road. At first I thought it was just a trick of the light, you know? Like maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me because of the shadows or something. But as I got closer, I realized it was definitely a person. A woman, to be exact. Now let me tell you, it's weird enough to see someone standing alone on a deserted road in the middle of the night. But what really gave me chills was the way she was just... standing there completely still, like she was waiting for something. I couldn't help but slow down, my curiosity peaked. I mean, what was she doing out here all alone at this hour? Was she in trouble? Did she need help? As I got closer, I could make out more details. She was wearing this long white dress that seemed to glow in the moonlight, and her hair was blowing in the breeze. It was like something out of a movie, surreal and eerie all at once. Now, I'm not usually one to get spooked easily, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about her, something not quite right. It was like this weird sense of unease settling in the pit of my stomach. I debated for a moment whether I should stop and see if she needed any help, but then something made me hesitate. Call it intuition or whatever you want, but something just didn't feel right about the whole situation. But curiosity got the better of me, and before I knew it, I was rolling down the window and calling out to her, asking if she needed any help. But she didn't respond. She just stood there, staring off into the distance with this blank expression on her face. 
it sent shivers down my spine. So there I am, standing on the side of the road, feeling the weight of confusion and curiosity bearing down on me. The woman in the white dress, she's just standing there, staring off into the distance with this blank expression on her face. It's enough to give you the chills, you know? I call out to her, but she doesn't respond. She just keeps staring, like she's in a trance or something. And then, without a word, she starts walking. Not towards me, but into the nearby forest. Now I don't know about you, but seeing someone wander off into the woods in the middle of the night? That's not exactly normal behavior. I mean, what was she doing out there all alone? I debate for a moment whether I should follow her, but something tells me that's not the best idea. I mean, who knows what could be lurking in those woods. I watch as she disappears into the darkness of the trees, her white dress glowing faintly in the moonlight. It's like something out of a horror movie, and I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. But then, I remember that feeling in the pit of my stomach. That sense that there's something I need to do, something I can't quite put my finger on. So instead of following her, I reach for my phone and dial 911. The dispatcher picks up after a few rings, and I quickly explain the situation to them, trying my best to sound calm and collected even though my heart is racing a mile a minute. I tell them about the woman in the white dress, about how she just appeared out of nowhere and started walking into the forest. They assure me that they'll send someone out to check it out, but I can't shake the feeling of unease that settles over me. I mean, what if something happens to her out there? What if she's in trouble? I watch as the flashing lights of the police car appear in the distance, relief washing over me like a tidal wave. Maybe now we'll finally get some answers, I think to myself. But deep down, I know that this is just the beginning of a journey into the unknown. A journey that will take me to places I never could have imagined. As I wait for the police to arrive, I can't help but wonder about the woman in the white dress. Who was she? What was she doing out here all alone in the middle of the night? And most importantly, where did she go? So after I called the cops, I waited there on the side of the road, feeling all jittery and unsure. I mean, who knew what they'd find out there in the woods, right? It felt like ages, but eventually, I spotted the flashing lights of the police car rolling up. I dashed over to them, spilling out everything I'd seen to the officers. You know me, I can be quite the chatterbox when I'm nervous. I told them all about the woman in the white dress, how she just appeared out of nowhere and strolled off into the woods like she was taking a leisurely midnight stroll. But when they went to check it out, nada. Not a single trace. It was like she pulled a Houdini, vanishing into thin air without leaving so much as a footprint behind. The cops did their whole shebang, searched the place, combed through the trees, but they came up empty-handed. I couldn't help but feel a bit freaked out, watching them scour the area. I mean, how could someone just disappear like that? It's straight up spooky. Then, a few days later, I catch wind of this news report about a missing woman who looked exactly like the lady I saw on the side of the road. Talk about goosebumps. I mean, what if I was the last person to see her before she vanished into thin air? It's got me feeling all kinds of uneasy, you know? Like, what really went down out there in those woods? Was she okay, or was she... gone? I called the police again about it, but they told me the exact same thing again that they searched that forest and couldn't find any trances of her within the forest. It's like she just vanished. I still think about that night, wondering if I could have helped her, if there was anything I could have done. If I followed her into those woods, something would have happened to me too, you know? I hope that they find her one day. You know, I've always prided myself on being the practical type, especially when it comes to my job. Working the night shift at the hospital, you see a lot of things that might make the average person's skin crawl, but I've always taken it in stride. That's part of the job, after all. But there was this one night, right around Christmas, that really tested my resolve. It was unusually quiet, you know, the way small towns get when it's snowing. The whole world seemed to be asleep, blanketed under a thick layer of snow. There's something about that kind of silence, especially in the middle of the night, that makes you feel like you're the only person left in the world. I was making my rounds in the old wing of the hospital, which, if you believe the rumors, is supposed to be haunted. 
Now, I've never been one to believe in ghost stories. I've always thought there's a rational explanation for everything. But that night, as I was walking past room 4113, I couldn't shake this eerie feeling. The room had been empty for weeks because of some renovations, so it caught me off guard when I heard what sounded like whispers coming from inside. My first thought was that maybe someone had accidentally been assigned to the room, or perhaps it was just the wind. Still, I couldn't just ignore it. As I stood there, outside the door debating whether to go in, the whispers seemed to grow louder, almost as if they were calling out to me. It was the strangest thing, feeling both drawn to and terrified of what I might find. I remember thinking, this is silly. You're a grown woman, a nurse. There's nothing in there that you can't handle. So, I pushed the door open, half expecting to find someone playing a prank or a patient who had wandered in. But the room was empty, bathed in this eerie moonlight that cast long shadows across the floor. It was so quiet, I could hear my own heartbeat. I was about to turn back, chalk it up to my imagination running wild, when I saw her. And there she was, standing by the window, her back to me. She was wearing this old-fashioned gown, like something out of a historical drama, you know? For a split second, I thought I had stumbled into the wrong room, or maybe gone back in time. It was surreal, seeing someone so out of place, yet there she was, clear as day. I called out to her, Ma'am, can I help you? But she didn't respond, didn't even move. It was like I wasn't even there. My mind was racing, trying to figure out what was going on. Was she a patient who had slipped away? But how did she get into a locked, empty room? And that dress? It didn't make any sense. Curiosity got the better of me, and I stepped into the room, the air somehow feeling colder. I approached her slowly, half expecting her to turn around and laugh at my bewildered face. But she just stood there, silent, staring out into the snow. It was when I reached out to touch her shoulder, to make sure she was real, that things took a turn for the downright bizarre. My hand, it went right through her. Like, there was nothing there but air. I stumbled back, my heart racing like a freight train. I blinked, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me. But when I looked again, she was gone, just vanished into thin air. I stood there in the middle of the room, trying to make sense of what just happened. My rational mind was at war with what my eyes had just seen. Ghosts didn't exist, right? There had to be an explanation. But how do you explain someone disappearing right in front of you? Shaken, I left the room, closing the door behind me like it would lock away what I had just experienced. The rest of my shift felt like a blur. I kept going over it in my head, trying to find a logical explanation. But how do you rationalize the irrational? So there I was, walking out of room 4113, feeling like I'd just stepped out of a Twilight Zone episode. I made my way back to the nurse's station, half expecting Rod Serling to pop out and give a closing monologue. But of course, it was just me and the usual night shift silence. I had to tell someone about what happened, if only to make sure I wasn't losing my mind. So, I found one of my co-workers during a break and spilled the whole story. I expected disbelief, maybe a laugh or two, but instead she went pale. You've seen her too, she whispered, like we were sharing some secret. Turns out there's a legend about room 413. Decades ago, a young woman died there under mysterious circumstances, and people say she never really left. Hearing that sent a chill down my spine, not gonna lie. But at the same time, it was almost... comforting? Like... Maybe I hadn't imagined the whole thing. My coworker and I ended up swapping ghost stories for the rest of the break, laughing about how we're supposed to be the rational, science-believing types. Yet here we were, talking about hauntings like it was just another part of the job. I went home that morning with the sun coming up, the world looking a little different, a little more mysterious. I kept thinking about the woman in room 413, about all the things we don't understand, and maybe aren't meant to. And you know what? I'm okay with that. The world's a lot more interesting with a bit of mystery in it. So yeah, that's my ghost story. Not something I ever thought I'd have, but I guess life likes to throw you curveballs, 
Or, you know, ghostly apparitions in empty hospital rooms. Same difference, right? That's a wrap for today on The Midnight Mystery. Hope you guys had as much fun as we did. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. Oh, and don't be shy. Drop a comment below with your thoughts or any cool mystery ideas you want us to check out. Until next time, we'll see you in the next Midnight Mystery.